Hi, my name is Carol Netter. I'm a physical therapist at UCLA's outpatient rehab department. And today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the basic stages of rehab following ACL reconstruction surgery. In the first stage of therapy, lasting about three to four weeks after surgery, ther physical therapy is helping the patient recover from basically the trauma of, of having surgery. Um, we'll use modalities, we'll use taping techniques, manual techniques to help control the swelling. Um, another big loss from the, from the surgery is range of motion. So a patient won't be able to bend their knee completely, they won't be able to extend their knee completely, and so in physical therapy you're doing various different exercises, one of which is depicted here on regaining the range of motion. In addition to the motion of the knee, the swelling coming after surgery inhibits or sort of weakens the muscles around the knee. So in the front of the thigh, you have the quadricep muscles, the knee extensors. In the back of the thigh, you have the knee flexors, the hamstring muscles. And in the recovery after surgery, these muscles sort of become dumb. They sort of become inhibited. And so these first few weeks in, uh, in rehab are focusing on simple but really important exercises to help wake up that connection, to get your ability to control that contraction back. And so here you see a, a patient doing some quadricep isometric exercises. And in these first few weeks, you're exercising 10 to 20 minute bouts about three times a day. So it's short bouts of exercise, but we're having you do it multiple times a day to, to hit that frequency and, and regain your motion. In addition to the muscles around the knee, we're also starting to think about the muscles around the hip. If you think about it, the knee is 50% the femur bone and 50% the tibia bone. Well, on the other end of the femur is the hip joint. And as the hip joint moves, so, so moves the knee. So the hip joint really controls the knee a lot. And so in, in therapy, in this first stage and throughout therapy, you're going to see and experience a lot of work on your hip. Because as you return to play and return to movement, we want you to be able to use your hip to control or stabilize the knee. Here, our patient is doing a classic hip exercise. Ex exercise. It's called the clamshell. He's having to stretch the band by rotating and abducting his hip. So the last aspect to cover about stage one is that in these first few weeks, the patients are typically using crutches to support their walking, and they're in a hinged knee brace. Now in the beginning, when you come out of surgery, that knee brace is going to be locked in extension. So as we said, the muscles around the knee are, have been weakened. They're sort of, they're inhibited neurologically, and they're not going to contract or support your knee very well. So it's going to be really important to wear the knee brace whenever you're up and weight bearing, because the brace is going to serve to replace what your muscles have lost for the interim. Stage two comprises weeks four to approximately 16 after surgery. And here things are getting a little bit more interesting. Um, the patient's movement is normalizing, their walking is normalizing, they're starting or maybe already have weaned off of their brace, they're certainly off the crutches. Day-to-day -day movement is, is getting easier. So this stage of rehab is really focused on strengthening. In stage one, you had to learn how to just contract the muscle again and wake it up or activate it. Now the patient is in weight bearing and he's learning, he or she is learning to move uh, and control his or, own, his or her own weight. Um, classic exercises, squats, lunges, uh, moving laterally side to side, moving on a diagonal. So in all these positions, in all these motions, you'll, you'll see or notice that there's no machines involved. You're not getting on a machine and lifting weight. We are eventually going to add resistance to these motions with hand weights. But the real key or aspect of this type of strengthening is not only to build the muscle, but also learn how to move your body in a way that you use your hip and your knee muscles. You're using your hip to stabilize that knee. So remember, the femur comprises half of the knee and half of the hip. 
So we have to be able to use the hip muscles, the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, to control what that femur does as the patient uh, learns to cut and land and plant again. In this phase of rehab, things get a little bit tough on the patient and the family. Physical therapy is going to require that a patient spend 45 to 60 minutes at home, five to six days a week, doing exercises. So most of this time is spent doing the strengthening exercises that you learn in physical therapy. But um, in addition to that, you're getting on a bike, doing stationary bike, or maybe some incline walking on a treadmill or speed walking outside, starting to get a little bit of cardio back. And this time commitment uh, can get really get sticky for the patient and the family. And it's really important to, to talk as a family unit ahead of time to plan how we're going to get this done. You know, sometimes patients are lucky enough to, to use their physical education period at school to do their exercises. Um, and parents can help with scheduling and time management, but it's really going to be up to the patient to get it done. Your parents can't rehab for you. You have to do it yourself. So um, this is something to really keep in mind and be anticipating that this is gonna be a challenge to comply with this type of strict regimen for this period of time. Um, everyone struggles with it and your physical therapist usually should be able to give you some strategies to help you. Um, but I think mentally being prepared for it is one of the best things that you can do. So stage three of rehab starts around week 16. And at this point, the main focus is movement. If you've done your due diligence in uh, stage two and, and kept to your 45, 60 minutes a day, you're strong enough now to start doing the fun stuff, start moving and preparing to return to sport. At stage, uh, at week 16, typically you're stable enough and you've, and you've reached some benchmarks so that you can return to running. So that's about the time when the therapist is putting you back on the treadmill and guiding you through a jogging routine where you start at intervals before you get to some continuous jogging. Stage three starts around week 16. And at this point, therapy is focusing on retraining movement. Dr. Beck in her webinar last week discussed the mechanism of injury in ACL. And what we know is that most patients have a non-contact injury. They weren't hit, they didn't go through a traumatic impact. Basically the story goes, I landed, I planted, and I heard a pop. And what we know has happened is that the limb has essentially collapsed inward. It's called a medial collapse, or you might even hear the term valgus. And earlier I talked about the femur. The femur is half of the knee joint and the other end of the femur is half of the hip joint. So as the hip goes, so goes the knee. So the muscles of the hip, the gluteus maximus, gluteus medius, control the hip. They control that medial collapse. They keep the limb straight or stable when a person lands or plants. So in physical therapy over the last prior 16 weeks, a patient's been strengthening not only their thigh muscles, but also their hip muscles. And they've been doing specific exercises, squats and lunges and side lunges and one-legged squats, all in the preparation of learning to use the hip and the knee together in movement. So here you're going to see one of our patients going through some return to sport movements. So Starting at week 16, the patient's typically strong enough to start leaving the ground, and that means being able to jump again. You'll see jumping and landing, going to jumping on one leg, learning to take off and land with that hip stability. He's struggling. Um, and basically, in this stage, physical therapy is doing a, a watered down version of your sport. You have movements like deceleration that you see here. He's running forward, slowing down, stopping, and reversing. Therapy is going to take you through these movements, training you again to slow down, to make that stop, to make that, imp that, that landing with both your hip and your knee so that you keep that stability. Therapy will start you on slow 
slow speeds, ramping up the speed. At first, it's just a simple 90 degree cut like this fellow's doing here, back and forth, repetition after repetition, doing it in the clinic, you're working at home, you might even go into practice and doing it uh, alongside your team. Eventually, over the weeks, uh, the complexity of the task will be increased, the speed of the task will be increased, and getting closer and closer to what it's really like on the field or on the court. By month six, we are starting to test you on some return to sport measures. You'll be graded on movements like single leg hopping or, or cutting. And these tests give us an idea of how close you are or how ready you are uh, perhaps to go to back to sport. Um, we don't expect a patient to pass these tests at month six, but it's just a preparation, letting them know where they're weak, where they're strong, what they need to work on. By month nine to 12, that's when you're really getting into a more formal and definitive return to sport testing where you're getting graded, the doctor's looking at your grades, the physical therapist is looking at those grades, and everyone's coming together to make the decision of when you're cleared to leave the rehab clinic and move back to the field or back to the court. So at this point, you're able to move out of the clinic and back to the court or back to the field. So now I'd like to bring in my colleagues and talk about this transition because this is a really important aspect of recovering from the ACL reconstruction surgery. I'm joined by my colleagues. Uh, we have Doug, Dr. Doug Polster, who is a sports psychologist. He specializes in injury recovery. Is that correct? Absolutely. <laughs> and we have Dr. Jennifer Beck, who's an orthopedic surgeon who specializes in pediatric orthopedics. Sports orthopedics, is that correct? Yeah. Absolutely. All right. <laughs> Sorry, you guys. Your, ti <laughs> your titles are much longer than mine, so <laughs> I can't keep up with all the fancy stuff. Um, Dr. Beck, I'm going to start by asking you a question. Absolutely. Coming in straight out of surgery uh, to the physical therapist, therapy office for the first time. My clients are often telling me that their doctor didn't tell them anything. And now I know that's not quite right. I know they get a packet of papers, they get information. And, but one thing specifically, oftentimes they're coming in fully with their wounds still fully dressed from the surgery. Um, now I know what I do with that dressing, but um, I would love to hear what your expectations are. Yeah. for that wound dressing. It's, it's really tough. I think we in medicine take for granted that I do this every single day. So the words and the instructions come very naturally, but it's hard for someone who's never heard the concept of an ACE wrap before. And then they're thinking about crutches and all of these things. I think a lot of doctors are starting to recognize that written down information or having information on websites can be very helpful just so that that written instructions, they can go back to it later on. I know here at UCLA, every time we operate, they get a big packet of information that has not only instructions about anesthesia, but phone numbers to call. And it can be very daunting because patients get this and don't really know what to do with it. Mm -hmm. So I think the first most important thing is once you've come down from the day or two after surgery and you're realizing, oh, I have some questions, I'm feeling better, just take a look through that information because I bet a lot of your questions will be answered straight in that information. And I think it is very important also that there probably isn't a phone number in there for your doctor's office that you shouldn't be guessing. We as doctors want to make sure you're taken care of and that you have the right thing happening. So never hesitate to call an office and find out. When it comes to dressings, most of us, um, when we're doing the surgery, the nice thing is, is the incisions are pretty small and taking care of young active athletes tend to heal pretty easily. Complications with wounds, thankfully, are very rare. We, we in the surgery, at the end of it, put on this dressing, so everything's really clean underneath there. Most of us like to keep that dressing on at least for two or three days after the surgery, just to let everything heal up, let some initial healing happen, make sure that you don't have any problems with bacteria, contamination, things coming in there. After that point, dressings should definitely be coming off because there's big dressings, very bulky, that sometimes can really limit how their brace fits, how they bend and straighten their knee, it starts sliding down their leg. And so if it's been a couple days already after surgery, taking that dressing off and giving them a new one, a new ACE wrap, I think is very helpful. Great. 
That dressing is also very important for swelling management also. So keeping that ACE wrap, if you do take it off or giving them a new one, especially around the knee so that you're debulking the dressing, but then keeping a new ACE wrap on afterwards, I think is very helpful. Great. Doug, my next question is for you. So I, I talked in my uh, one-on-one -on -one speech about compliance to home exercises. So um, in the second stage of rehab, a patient is really required to put in some real time, 45 to 60 minutes a day, most days out of the week, doing exercises. And for the first time, uh, this is a first time activity for most of these people. You know, the, the kids are used to going to play sports and going to practice, but they're not used to just doing rote exercises alone for 45 minutes. Um, so do you have any insight or suggestions on inspiring someone to be compliant with that and to stay motivated with that? that regimen. Absolutely. I think you hit the, the, the nail on the head. Rehab can be boring right? and it can be mindless. Um, when you're in with your PT, it can be more fun and it can be challenging and you're being coached. But when you're at home and you're by yourself, motivation can drop and you can almost feel less motivated if mom and dad are the ones coaching you. Sometimes that actually has the opposite <laughs> effect. So parents, that's a normal thing for your kids to want to fight back against. So a couple things I think um, from the PT side that we can let the patients know early on is that developing these home-based exercises is just like learning a new skill in your sport. So the first time you practice a new move in practice, it didn't go that well, chances are, and you needed to work on it. Um, and so PT exercises are very similar. They're new, they're unique, and there's something that you have to build sort of muscle memory for and, mm -hmm. and train your brain and your body to expect that this is what I'm going to have to do each day. Um, in part three of our webinar series, we're going to go through a few more pieces of information and tidbits on motivation and how to go through some of these rehab strategies. Uh, but just briefly, uh, I like to have my patients include those rehabilitation strategies in their everyday life so it doesn't feel like they're taking time out for the strategies. So whether it's while they're watching TV, while they're playing video games, while they're sitting on the side at PE, um, or while they're at practice, not being able to practice, taking advantage of that time to, to do their exercises so it doesn't feel like they're pulling out an extra 45 minutes to an hour of their day. Um, and so helping it fit in with the flow of their normal day is one of the, the, the best ways to continue to feel motivated and to be adherent to the um, strategies that That's are given great. by their PT. Great advice. My last subject or last topic is where I left off um, in my talk, and that's the, the transition from rehab to sport, from the clinic back to the field, back to the court. Um, and so I, one thing that often comes up, or I hear my patients say, is my knee doesn't feel like the other side. When is my knee going to, is that okay? First of all, is that normal? Um, I'm, I'm cutting on it, I can cut, and it doesn't hurt, it just doesn't feel the same. When is that gonna change? When is that gonna get back to normal? Is it gonna get back to normal? Is the fact that it feels different normal? Um, so, Dr. Beck, do you have any insight into that yeah. question? I That's think that one. I think every time patients coming in, we're constantly evaluating how their knee's functioning, how their muscle recovery is. I think there's a couple different phases to does my knee feel normal, is this normal? I think in the beginning, you're in those first few months, a lot of people have some front of the knee pain, which is very common as that quad muscle is weak, and they can get some popping and clicking in their knee as, as part of that. Some people may have had popping and clicking beforehand because of a meniscus tear or cartilage injury, and so differentiating which one of those is the cause of it is, I think, a very reassuring for, thing for patients is a lot of that awkward feeling, not feeling normal, it actually comes from their patellofemoral joint. As they continue their rehab, their muscles get stronger, their muscle memory, everything gets better, that absolutely goes away. And a lot of it, I think, is also understanding and getting a confidence in your knee. One of the big things that we do at, at UCLA Health as part of our recovery process is we actually take our patients through a return to sport test where we take them through and do a muscle strength testing. We do a static balance testing. We do actual hop testing and we compare one side to the other. And I think it's very easy for me as a surgeon to say, your testing looks great, your knee looks great, but having those actual hard facts where I can show them side by side of, look, these two muscles are functioning very similar, or here's why it feels a little different because this muscle group isn't working that right, 
let's talk to your physical therapist and see what we can do. And having that objective data, I think is very helpful in a day and age where data and figures and numbers is very important. Often we'll send them back to their physical therapist and retest them even a little bit later. And when they see that things have gotten better, they have that data to know, okay, I can be a little bit more confident in this. And that's, I think, a big part of, okay, we're just working on this and, and it not feeling normal can take a long time. Let me um, add a little bit to your topic of anterior knee pain, that front of the knee pain. Um, it's a common thing that we see, especially when you have a certain type of graft that involves a patellar tendon. Um, a big uh, aggravation, I would say, for, for someone like me is for a, a athlete to come in and say, oh, well, squats hurt, so my, my physical therapist, my other therapist told me not to do them. We talked in my, in my speech about moving in a way that uses the hip and the knee, training the body to move, uh, the muscles to fire in a way that the hip stabilizes the knee. The hip does its job, the knee does its job. Um, when you are quad dominant or knee dominant and you're not very good at using your hip, you run into things like front of the knee pain. Um, so. Although it's a common occurrence, it normally can be uh, mitigated by correcting someone's mechanics. So please don't ever, ever let a patient slide with, oh, I just won't do that exercise because it hurts. Because it just means they're not doing it correctly. And if they learn the right mechanics, they learn how to fire the muscles correctly, they're not going to have that load on the front of the knee and that pain will go away. Absolutely. So Carol, I think that's a really good point when it comes to how we perceive pain and how we perceive an injury. And so one of the things that I tell all of my patients is that pain doesn't always equal re-injury. Exactly. And in this case, pain isn't injury, pain is malfunction of movement. Yeah. And so we need to train our body to move a little differently to remove pain. And it's not that our body is injured and that's why we're in pain. And so we'll talk more in part three about sort of restructuring our thought process around pain and how if we're always using pain as a trigger for re-injury, we're actually going to open ourselves up for a much longer recovery than we would want and a more frustrating recovery. Whereas if we view pain as a signal of maybe I need to modify rather than I'm re-injured, that can be much more helpful in the recovery process. And a, and a good physical therapist will be able to guide you through that process, knowing what pain is normal normal mm -hmm. and what pain is not um, and be able to make the right corrections and if and if we can't figure it out then we call the orthopedic surgeon yeah and I think that the important word <laughs> that you used is modify is that telling someone they can't do something is a really strong word and that sticks with them because they're thinking like they're failing what they're doing is not working mm -hmm. and so I really try and use those words of okay this one particular exercise wasn't the right thing but there's other things you can do because just saying no isn't going to get you back to your sports isn't going to get you back to your goals and it really changes their mind mindset is that we need to try something different. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's a big key part of, okay, maybe this one thing wasn't right, but there's other things we can do. Don't give up. Because I think that's a big part of what happens in this very long process is that patients get, lose their motivation when they hear can't, can't, can't over and over. So it's no, we're modifying and we're going to do something a little different and you will get better. Good. Okay. My last point to cover is just a little logistics. Um, questions about how, how long will I have to be in physical therapy? How many days a week will I have to be in physical therapy? Um, again, your physical therapy is not just the visit that you make to the clinic, it's what you do at home. And unfortunately, for this year, you're going to be doing a lot of physical therapy at home. And, and that's going to be close to an hour most days of the week. On our end, a patient um, after rehab is seen once to twice a week. Um, in some cases for a period of time, they might be seen up to three times a week uh, if they're needing special help, but once to twice a week. And I'll be seeing a patient through most of the, that first year. Uh, do you have any input or interest? Yeah, absolutely. I tell people through I like once or twice a week, definitely for this, through the first three months. That's the yeah. really critical part. Recovery from surgery, getting back to normal life. After that three month mark is when we're starting to talk about the specialty things, the running, the sports specific. Yeah. 
a lot of that really comes down to what else do they have access to? Do they have athletic trainers at their school? Do they have access to a community center? What kind of education do they have about sport and fit fitness? What's their baseline? Usually around that three to four month part is when we're starting to talk about running and jogging. And a lot of people think that's a really just innate thing, just go for a run. Mm -hmm. You forget how to do that and that forgetting how to run and not knowing how to properly run can get you injured later on. So I really encourage my patients through that getting back to running cycle at least every other week to check in with their physical therapist to make sure their technique is correct, to make sure they're advancing properly. So I think that that's really important. The, the first three months, very consistent. After that, they can start tapering, but using the physical therapist to help keep progressing you, giving you more tips, tricks, avoiding injuries, making sure your technique's being corrected, I think is very important. At UCLA, we, we use a benchmark of a single leg squat with good stability for that return to running uh, signal. Mm -hmm. And then, like you said, it's normally around week 16. Um, and in physical therapy, we'll be videoing the patient on the treadmill, analyzing their running phase so they can see the faults that they might have and some some people it's a really easy transition and, and some it's a little harder to to have trust in in loading that leg again but um definitely physical therapy can can help even just the regimen of intervals okay you're not going to go out for a three mile jog you're going to start run a minute walk a minute yeah. you know and so on and so forth and, and and so physical therapy definitely helps to to walk patients through that stuff um do you do we have any do you have any questions for me or should we wrap up this rehab segment of our so I think the the biggest thing kind of you mentioned to me about the after surgery paperwork one thing I always ask my patients is did your physical therapist give you a home exercise program I similarly sometimes get some blank stares which I know the physical <laughs> therapists are doing it and similar that's a lot of information so what would you say from that home exercise program, is it something you're verbally giving patients? Are they getting handouts? Are they getting websites? Um, how are you giving those that, those instructions so right. that I make sure that our, I can reinforce that with my yeah. patients as well? Excellent question. So um, for every patient, it can be a little bit different. Um, certainly they're given some type of uh, picture reference. Sometimes that's videoing their movement and their exercises with their phone in the clinic so that they can to see themselves and they have me barking the, the orders in the video. Mm -hmm. And other times it's just a simple handout with a picture of the exercises. Um, what I like to do at, at UCLA is also, in addition to the individual picture reference, is to give a routine, mm -hmm. okay? So you're gonna start your, your 20 minute routine. So in the beginning of phase one, you're right, it is only 20 minutes, but you're doing it multiple times a day. And then later on it turns into longer bouts, right? So First thing on the routine, oh, I have to do this isometric hold, one-legged balance. Then I'm going to do a set of squats and then a set of lunges and then a set of one-legged squats. And I'm going to go back up and do another round of that circuit of exercises. So they're given a typed regimen. And as things are added or some things might be removed, there that list is kind of continuing uh, to be handed out on a week-to-week -week or every other week basis so that... I try to make it simple. Do these steps, and once you've done these <laughs> steps, you can turn, you can stop, you know, <laughs> and, and, yeah. and turn your video game back on or yeah. whatever. But, but yeah, that's yeah. so we are giving them the exercises, yeah. and that's what I always tell my patients: is if they haven't or you misplace them, when's your next PT session, and make sure you go home with that home program because it's so important. I think that as a last point to the importance of of following your your PT's instructions, one of the biggest challenges in injury recovery is the unknown. So the unknown of time frames, the unknown of what to do, the unknown of what pain means. So those unknown factors can influence our motivation to follow mm -hmm. through. And so I always tell my patients, you know your body, but your PT knows how to use your body most efficiently. That's going to help you get better and rehabbed mm -hmm. in, the most, in the quickest way possible. And so work with your PT and those instructions that they give you on what works, what doesn't, and they can help you modify and create the best program that's specific for your body um, because they're the experts in how to, to rehab uh, your own body. Thank you, Dr. Polster. Thank you, Dr. Beck. I appreciate your time today and this collaboration.